Hey guys, James Daynard here. I've actually been talking for the last five minutes and I didn't realize it wasn't muted. So we're gonna we're gonna go backwards now and I'm gonna restart. Uh I apologize for that. Um someone just let me know they couldn't hear me. So we're gonna restart. Um thanks for everybody for coming out. Uh sorry you couldn't hear me earlier. Um we're gonna kinda go over uh this is a construction one oh one part three. Um if you haven't seen the, the or listened to the first two parts in the series they're available on our website heatandaner.com under the media section and you can download those and listen to them at any time uh, if you haven't joined us yet uh, if you want to know who i am uh, i'm an active real estate broker and investor um, who works in seattle the seattle area king pierce of Snohomish county um, we i have flipped in the last 12 years over 500 homes so i have lots of experience i have a 500 homes that teach me valuable lessons. Some are expensive, some are good ones. Um, and that's what we're here to do is to kind of give you guys our lessons and kind of help you guys through your projects um, and give you our tips that we use in our current projects right now. Uh, currently, we have about 50 projects going, so we're very active investors. Um, and not only am I an investor, I'm a real estate inv a broker that specializes in, in getting investors discounted real estate products and then helping them design and sell their asset to get them the top dollar. Uh, in the market. So uh, currently, uh, or year to date, we sold over 1,300 listings for investors, helping them design them and getting them sold. So we, we do a lot of volume and we got lots of uh, expertise that we can help you out on your project on if you need it. So what we covered, to recap what we covered in part one and two, um, we'll go through this really briefly. Again, if you want to download it, it is on the website, uh, heatdanner.com. So the, in the first part, what we covered was what to look for in your initial walkthrough and then how to evaluate those findings as you're walking through it, and then how to get prepared uh, for your contractor before you meet them to get your estimate. And you guys, that's very important. Always be prepared before you meet them on site. And then preparing your budget, how to actually crunch your numbers and put it together before you actually meet your contractor. Uh, part two went over co for considerations for your budget, hiring your contractor in the bidding process, how to kind of scrub that contractor, make sure that they're, um, that they're good people and they're gonna do good work for you. And then uh, in part two, I also gave you guys some budget tips and tricks that I use to kind of keep my budgets under controls. And then uh, you, you'll see a lot of contracts and forms. And in this, in part two and in part three, we're very big on having a template and, uh, uh, you know, a contract with anybody we do business with. It's a very good way to template out the job and the expectations. So what we're going to learn on uh, part three is it's all about change orders and punching a house and getting the project finished out. So what we're going to go over today is what is a change order? If anyone doesn't know what that is, that you're kind of lucky. That means you haven't had to pay one. Um, protecting yourself from them and then dealing with them in your budget and how to get the price to where you can pay for the change orders but not kill your budgets. Uh, we're, again, we're going to give you some more tips and tricks that I use on a daily basis. Uh, when to change your scope of work because as change orders come up it can kind of mess up your budget so there's there's ways that you can control your budget by changing the scope of work with whatever's going on in the market conditions uh, punching out a house how to make sure it looks good and ready for market um, that's a very important thing right now in today's market uh, contractor final payments and then uh, question and answers immediately following so anytime during the presentation guys if you have questions feel free to just type them in in the text box and we'll get to them afterwards. We're going to do a 30-minute presentation and then 30 minutes of questions and answering. So if you can ask anything, I'm uh, here to kind of help and, and give you guys free advice. So first thing we're going to talk about, which no one wants to deal with, is dealing with change orders. They happen. So what is a change order? For those who may not know, a change order is a change in the original scope of work or the original budget you know an unexpected item that can come up during a project whether it's you pull out a wall and you thought it had all copper plumbing now there's galvanized uh, which is a change in scope of work um, or anything from um, maybe you pull out your carpet and you find really nice hardwoods and it reduces your scope of work so um, that is a change so it's just a change of the original scope um, any also a change order is a change in time frame to completion date which a lot of people don't know if you have penalties in your contract that penalize the contractor uh, for being delayed on the project, that is also a change order because they're changing their completion date. Um, a change of pricing, uh, what a change order, uh, change pricing only happens on materials if it's changed after uh, prior allowances have been established. 
And then one thing that we always want uh, to kind of emphasize is all change orders should be documented in writing. Never do a verbal change order. You will end up spending more money if you do a verbal. You know, just like anything, you want to have it in a contract with an itemized breakdown of everything going on so then you can evaluate it and then look at your scope of work and what we can change to keep the budget down. Um, so what everybody probably wants to know is how do you reduce these change orders up front? So, and you guys, change orders are hard because, you know, a lot of times these houses that we're buying as investors are neglected, beat up homes, and there's deferred maintenance. And even though you may prepare for a lot of the deferred maintenance, things come up. And no one has a crystal ball, and so that's very important to just kind of be prepared for it. Um, so what I do to make sure that I don't get change orders is when I'm doing my budget, I always have a spec allowance. Um, what I do on 95% of my projects, unless it's a very quick project that we're trying to move fast on, is I have my specs already selected prior to the contractor bidding the project because I want them to know the exact pricing of the materials that I want installed. Um, allowances, if you don't have the exact materials picked, allowances allow you to make sure that you're not picking something later to where the contractor is going to change it, uh, the price on you. Or you may have talked about, you know, installing laminate floors in a house. And they might have said 99 cents and you were thinking they were going to be $2 or a little bit nicer ones. And then there becomes a debate and a change order. So just always make sure you either have your specs picked or your allowance set. Um, uh, one other thing uh, that I do to reduce my change orders is my construction contract verbiage. Now, in the attachments for you guys, we do have a copy of a construction uh, contract, which was also in uh, part two. But we, you know, again, it's available for you guys to download and take a look at. But you'll notice the verbiage in there is very clear and very uh, defined all the way through. So, uh, in my construction contract, it always uh, notates how all change orders will be handled. You know, whether it's a delay in time, a delay in price, and then the process that the contractor has to do to make sure that change order is, is uh, accepted. What this does is it prevents them from having a verbal conversation for me, and then all of a sudden charging me at the very end and say, no, you agreed to this verbal. Because you guys, verbal is a contract. So what you want to do is make sure that you got a detailed writing on how to handle those change orders. Um, also, outside of uh, just having all the verbiage correct in my contract, I always make sure that I have the contractor bid and my own personal scope work tied to my construction contract. So if the contractor forgot to put some of the stuff in that was in my scope of work, but he just didn't put it in, he's still tied to both of those. So not only does it protect me in his bid, but it also protects me in my scope of work that all those items are included in his bid. And then always a clear scope of work. Construction contracts are only good if your bid and your scope of work is very detailed. If they're broad in nature, the contract is get, you're going to have a hard time uh, enforcing your contract. So you guys always make sure everything's detailed out and budgeted out and itemized out for you. Don't throw it in once it's all bid at the very end. You know what I always tell investors is don't just say, "Hey, uh, the contractor." Don't let them just submit something with a bunch of writing with a lump sum at the end. You want everything itemized out. Uh, and then all changes, the scope of work or pricing must be in writing. Again, uh, touching back on that, have it in writing, no verbal. Verbal will allow the contractor to, A, charge you more at the end. And if you don't like that, then they have a right to lean your property based on a verbal commitment. And then the other thing that we do to make sure that there's no change orders up front is we do everything on a fixed bid. No time and materials. All items, uh, all items on that bid need to be itemized for the direct cost. So again, I don't do the lump sum and have a number at the very end. It, everything is broken out individually, like flooring. I know exactly how much the flooring is, what the square footage is, and what they're charging me per square foot. So again, just make sure everything's very detailed out. The more vague the contract is, the, the more vague the job is. And the more vague the job is, it means the more vague the bid is, and that means it's gonna cost you more money at the end. So what I wanted to kind of pull out of our contract that's attached is just two things that I uh, have in our contract, uh, you know, that I wanted to look at. One is fixed bid, right? So this is a lump sum amount. So how we have it written in our contract is that the contractor is acknowledging the dollar amount and that everything in the scope of work and all the pricing is included in that lump sum. So he can't come back and say, this cost me more. Um, 
for me, having a contractor saying this costs me more, that means he's being inefficient. Uh, if he's being inefficient, that means that I don't need to pay for his inefficiencies. Also, what this reference is that uh, sales tax must be included in their bid. Uh, one thing that has happened to me in the past is we had contractors used to put tax included in their price, and then we were actually audited by the uh, by the IRS when they had not paid their taxes. And I had to pay a $41,000 tax bill because the contractors had not paid their sales tax bill. So again, make sure your tax is always listed and itemized out in that bid. And then uh, the other part I wanted to put in here was how changes are handled. So the contractor just can't change things and bill me at the end. He has to follow a specific format and how that's going to be handled and how he's going to be getting paid. So because this is all detailed out in my contractor, it keeps the the contractor inside my box of where I can't, he can't just do what he wants to do during the project. Um, the other thing that we wanted to put in here is a lien release sample. So after my contractor's paid in full, what I also do to protect myself and was also protect change orders or my budget is making sure that they sign a lien release saying that all uh, contractors and subcontractors have been paid in full. So there's two different types of lien releases. There's a conditional and an unconditional lien release. What you want signed is an unconditional lien release. What that means is that means every subcontractor by that general has been paid and he is guaranteeing that. What we have done for you guys is just uh, added uh, a lien release example into the, the supplements so you can download that too for your own personal projects. Um, we do advise that you have a contract or a attorney review any document that you ever download from us or any other uh, website uh, just to make sure that it fits with your specific project. Um, but again, it's, it's down there to download, but always have your contractors sign a lien release. It protects you down the road to where if they didn't pay their subs that you won't get stuck with their bills. So some tips and tricks, which I think is what most people want to hear about, um, that how I kind of reduce my change orders on the on projects. So the first thing that I do is I make sure my budget is protected with a finish date and expectations and penalties. What does that have to do with change orders? It has everything to do with change orders because most of the time, even if you give a contractor a really good timeline, they're going to be late and they might have worked really hard and you don't want to charge them for the late penalties, which I don't quite often. Uh, but what I do use is I, it's a negotiating tool on change orders. So if my contractor is a week late and I have $100 per day late fee, that's $700 that he owes me in late fees. Now, if he did a good job and he got the project done as fast as he can and he worked hard, I typically don't charge him that $700. But let's say they open up a wall and there's a $1,000 beam that needs to be replaced and the beam may cost, you know, $300. What I do is I do a trade-off saying, hey, I know you're a little bit delayed. This is costing me for my hard money or my leverage cost. How about we do a trade? You install the beam for free, and I'll pay for the cost of the beam. And typically, what it does is it negotiates out a positive solution for the contractor. You're not penalizing him, so he's not getting penalized off his original scope, and you're reducing your change orders and your, your budget cost. So it's kind of a win-win. So I, I actually use all my late penalties to negotiate change orders with guys. Um, also, what I make sure I do in every project is instructions in the contract on how to deal with the change order time delays and processes. So what this does is if a, con a lot of times at the end of the project, if a contractor's late by two weeks, they'll make up excuses. Well, I ran into a clearance problem. I ran, my subcontractor didn't show. So in my construction contract, it dictates how people will have to handle um, their their process. So if he's delayed, he needs to send me a written change of scope of work, changing the, the the completion date. What this does, if he doesn't do that in the instructions that we all agreed upon, then I still can penalize him and reduce some of my change order um, costs. The other thing is make sure you have a very clear scope of work. Um, you know, review your current contract and then make sure that everything is itemized out in your bids. I will not sign any bid or hire anybody unless it is broken down by cost basis. I want to know exactly how much my electrical costs, I want to know exactly how much my plumbing costs, and I don't want to lump some at the end. Um, the other thing is I get a second opinion. So
so, uh, you know, luckily I have a business partner that's ran into a lot of things. So we talk about a lot of projects. I'll call other investors or, um, luckily for me, I have a really good broker team. They can go out and check on things for me and they'll give me opinions too on how they think we could design things. Uh, let's say we opened up a wall and we, we have a big post there instead of replacing it with a beam and spending a thousand to two thousand dollars. We might just work around our layout with, um, with the design. And they, my favorite tip and trick is when a contractor calls me out to site, and I talked about this, I think, in our first one, is, well, that's not a big deal, right? And as long as I act like it's not a big deal, they don't think it's a big deal. And that alone has probably saved me thousands of dollars every week. So I'm like, well, what's the big deal? You just put a beam, you put a four by four post in, or you just, you know, if I got rotted subfloors, well, it's just plywood. Plywood costs 30 bucks, and it takes you an hour to put it in. But if you think it's a big deal, they're going to charge you like it's a big deal. So always keep your calm and, and act like it's not a big deal. If you think it might be a big deal and you don't know, call your broker, call your team, see see what they, the kind of recommendations they can do. Um, you know, our, our brokerage, it's, all our brokers are specially t t trained on construction, so they can bring it in to me and we give them, we coach our clients through those problems. Um, never ask the contractor for a price without prior doing research. You know, so again, it's not a big deal, right? That shouldn't cost very much, right? Don't go out there and say, oh, well, what do you think that's going to cost? Because if you don't know, he's going to charge you a lot more. Um, and then uh, scope of work trade off. So one thing, I may open up a wall and something could be not what I like in there and it could blow up my budget by two grand. What I do, it will do is then evaluate all my specs, details, and my comps and maybe start trading out the things. Maybe I don't put a full tile backsplash in my kitchen and take $1,000 off. Or maybe I paint my fireplace instead of tile it. As long as it's not going to uh, negatively impact my resale, I'll, tr I'll, I'll do trade of uh, scope of work trade-offs. And then the other thing that I do, because this prevents a lot of debate uh, problems with contractors and maybe mis misfires, is I post my specs to the site after drywall on the wall. So if I want a specific tile with a specific way it's set, I post it with a picture so then the contractor knows exactly how to install it. Now, if they install it the wrong way, which I may not like, but it might pass, I'll give them a break, but then I'll reduce my change orders because they did it the wrong way. Um, so one tip that I always like to emphasize is know what people are charging you. Always know what your subcontractors and co contractors are charging you per square foot per work. That's going to always reduce your budget and your change orders. If they have to install 500 square feet of flooring, I know I'm going to pay him $1.50 a square foot to install that. So when to change your scope of work? Um, this, is, this goes in with your change orders because, again, you can reduce the cost off your, um, off your change orders. Um, and you guys, just have one thing I want to touch on, we started about seven or eight minutes late, so we're going to run about seven or eight minutes late on the presentation too. It's just we have that little snag uh, with the audio, so uh, might go a little bit past 6.30 on the presentation. Um, so when to change your scope of work? A, my scope of work change if there's any safety or mechanical concerns. A, I need to make sure my project is safe for the next buyer down the road. B, I need to make sure it's done correctly so I don't have any issues down the road. And then on mechanical concerns, I take care of those now because a buyer's the next buyer down the road is going to have an inspector and they're going to call you for these items. If your furnace is 12 years old but it works fine, they're probably going to call it that it's going to fail soon. So just try to, you know, change. Don't skimp on the mechanicals and put too much into the design. You want to make sure the mechanicals are done first and then adjust your design around that. Um, and then uh, change the scope work time frame issues. You know, if the time frame is, you know, if I'm going in and my initial project is to go in and, and permit a four-bedroom, three-bath house, uh, or take a two-bedroom, one-bath house and turn it into a four-bedroom, three-bath house, but the city is telling me that it's going to take me four months to get my permit, I'm going to change my scope of work and my whole design to get me around that time frame, and maybe I turn it into a uh, three-bedroom, two-bath and do less finished square footage or, uh, you know, adjust the scope to where I can get my permit faster and then reduce my leverage cost. Um, and then also I change my scope of work as I constantly check my asset evaluation. Values increase and decrease monthly. So what you bought a property at, and, you know, especially in the last 12 months, 
I mean, properties have gone up in 15% in a three month period, and now they've gone down 15% in a three month period. So it's very important that I'm working with a broker that can constantly track the market and give me constant advice on what I need to do or not do at my project. So make sure you pay attention to what's going on around you. Just don't focus on your project. And then as I change my scope of work, as change orders come in, sometimes change orders come in, my budget allows for it or the resale allows for it and I just keep going. Or if the market is you know, decreasing or not getting me anymore, I'll decrease my scope of work to, to reduce my construction costs and offset the change orders. Um, one tip we always like to tell people is the more prepared you come to your projects, the less variance you're going to have in your budget costs. Again, know exactly what you're buying, what the end goal is for the scope of work, and have a detailed plan to get you to that end goal for the contractor. If you don't have that plan, you're going to have a vague plan, and then the plan is going to get charged more. So always have a very, very detailed end goal of what you want to do. Um, so on the asset evaluation, you know, contact your broker. You know, for our brokers, they check on projects and values every two weeks on what's going on and send an update to our clients. So make sure you pay it. If you're one of our clients, please make sure you pay attention to those comparables coming in the market or call the broker and, and talk to them. Or if you're, you're not one of our clients, constantly be talking to your broker about what's going on with the market, what should be done, what they think will sell. And then really make sure that your broker you're working with understands budgets and costs because they might tell you to do something that will blow up your budget. And then uh, establish a value checkpoints during your project. So I always, no matter what, check my, uh, my uh, value on my house at demo, right before demo, because you know I've actually gone in, got my demo crews ready, about ready to rip everything out, and then a comp for the property sold for a lot more and it has its condition, and then I don't touch the project. And then I, I put it up for sale and make my money that way. So if I'm not checking my values, I don't know not to demo that, that house. Um, at rough-ins, after all my rough-ins, which is my electrical, my plumbing, my mechanical, anything kind of inside the walls are done, I always check my values again. I want to make sure that my rough-ins are in budget and that my end goal has not changed. And again, I check it after drywall because after drywall, all your finishes go in. So that is the time to make any changes cosmetically for your budget to maybe increase the scope work to get a higher dollar or decrease it to get a lower dollar. So again, Check it after drywall. That's the, probably the biggest time to check it. And then uh, I always evaluate my asset during my budgets. After change orders or budget change, I monitor that. And if I'm spending more on the house or spending less, what am I going to sell it for? So I need to check my asset. Um, what we want to do is show an example. This is actually really recent. Um, it's one of your projects. So we bought a home in Des Moines. Originally, when we bought it, uh, we had a target value of $499. Um, this was back in uh, June, so the market was a little bit hotter back then. Uh, so right before we started demo, I actually re-pulled comps, and what I saw was there were some actives on the market now sitting. Um, it was toward, getting towards the end of June. They were sitting at a 489 value. Okay, we were targeting to put in 70 grand this house, redo the whole thing, put in a new kitchen like the top right picture, um, and that's what we were trying to accomplish. But during that time, we also saw a comp sell quickly for 450, with, which would only take me 30, 30 to 35,000 to get it to that condition. So at that point, I'm looking at a cost difference of roughly about 35 grand to spend on the house to try and get an extra 35 grand at the house. And it's going to take me an additional probably six to eight weeks on the project, which is six to eight weeks of hard money payments. So because I checked that asset right before. Uh, we demoed, and our plan was to spend the full 70 to 80 grand on the property. We actually changed it all and, and redid the scope. So the bottom picture is actually the kitchen that we installed, uh, which is a painted out kitchen with new countertops, newer appliances, uh, vinyl, a little bit more contemporary vinyl floor, but we matched the, the comp, which is the picture on the left, to get the same end goal. And what this ended up doing is the one in the top right, active for 49, is still active right now. And we're pending at 450, and we spent half the amount of money. The reason being is this specific area is it's it's kind of price constraint right now in this market, and 450 is just the sweet spot. So again, check your scope of work, uh, evaluate your asset, and make changes prior to doing certain checkpoints. But this alone, right now, we would be just finishing up with the house, 
and we'd be on the market for $4.99 and we probably wouldn't be selling. So again, check your scope of work. Punch list. After you get your scope of work all completed, one of the most important things for an investor is to make sure your house is in turnkey market ready condition if you're selling it that way. Don't let last minute unbuttoned up items delay your sale. The first thing I tell people is don't expect your contractor to do it. I don't care if they have a general contractor's license or they're great. They always miss things. They have employees that kind of will cut corners. And so what you have to do is you have to check them. Their contractor will not do this 90% of the time. Um, and, you're, and it's always good to have an extra pair of eyes on it. You know, for our clients, we have the contractors do it. We tell the clients to do it. And then our brokers are trained to do a punch out as well. Um, I do all my punch lists. Uh, two weeks prior to finish date because I see major things that can get on it right away and I don't want extra delays. Uh, one week prior to finish because, again, I want that on the radar so I don't get more delays on my uh, or any delays getting it to, to list. And then I always do it right before listing. I do a double check. And if I need to push my listing one week because the house quite isn't done, that is what I will always do. Because putting the house up with a little bit of unfinished items, even if they're minor, Buyers will nitpick you right now. So don't let them nitpick you and move on to the next option. Um, and then what we do for all of our punch list homes is we have a document, and I'm going to go over this next. Uh, we use a, we blue tape the home, and then we use a punch list app document, which takes pictures and documents exactly what we want completed during the project. And then I don't pay my contractor until all final or final payment is only issued when the list is complete and all permits are signed off on. Don't let the guy not the contractor not sign off your permits because that can become a huge delay in your, your project. Plus, potential buyers think that it's not quite done all the way. So this is our uh, app that I use uh, for our punch list. Um, you know, we like it a lot. It's actually, if you just go on the Apple Store, it's called Punch List. It's a very handy app. You shoot it right on your phone. It throws the picture in, and then you can make uh, notations. This is actually one that our broker, Katie Kepler, just did for my own house this week. You know, I, I was thinking it was getting ready to be done. She went and punched it out for me. And now my project manager contract has a detailed list to get completed before we list the property. But this really does prevent kind of mix up in your sale. Um, as you can see, this is a screenshot, 37, 38, 39. We have actually 60 items on our punch list. So as we go into, uh, after we wrap up our punch list, one thing we would kind of want to go, go over is uh, the final payment to your contractor. So there's a couple little tricks that we use. Uh, you know, we've had contractors come after the fact and say, hey, we, you owe us more money because we didn't account for things right, but we had our contract in line. And then we also had our scope of work in line. So they can't really debate that. And then one thing that I always put in my final check to note is final payment. Because final payment means final. That means they're not going to come back and ask you for more money. So again, just always throw in final payment at the end to, to kind of help, um, you know, eliminate any kind of future project. And then always double check your scope of work. You know, as you go through this property, double check the scope of work. Use your um, use your bid to make sure they did every item on there. Make sure all permits are signed off on before you pay them. And then make sure they do all the punch list items. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is we also have a punch list document. for It's a checklist for you guys that's in the supplements. Um, you can download that too. Feel free to use that on any of your projects. It kind of just gives you a good template to walk through the property in a systematic order to where you can check off things. Um, and then one other thing that I do before I issue a final payment is check your bond and license status on the contractor because the last thing you want to do is issue him a check and have his bond expire. Um, and then I get my lien releases signed that we kind of went over previously. So now what we're going to do is we're going to open it up for questions for everybody. Um, I know we kind of went through a lot. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, it can be regarding one of your projects with us or one of your other projects or just general questions in um, general. Just feel free to type in the questions and we'll start answering them. Any questions, guys? All day long, I get questions for people about uh, contractor issues or specs and design. Or I definitely get a lot of phone calls about change orders. Um, so 
you guys have any questions, I'm here to answer. All right, we got a question from Nate. Uh, how do we get the handout? Good question. So, what you do is you actually click in that box. It should say handouts. And if you hit the little arrow and move it to the down, so it's the, I think the arrow will be facing right. It, you click on the arrow, it goes down. There are three PDFs in there for you. Do you find it? Let me do it. Okay. Well, uh, the handouts aren't working right now, so I will make sure they get done. Do you see a box that says handout three of five? Should we have the drop down menu, handouts, and then they'll, and if you click that, it should pull up lien waiver, sample construction contract, and walk through punch list. No one has any questions tonight. Okay, so yeah, um, so Dale says, uh, or one of, uh, says they found them. It's in the, the drop down box, Nate. So if you just click that, you should see all three PDFs. And for some reason, if you can't find it, we can email them over to you. Dale, the subject matter, the uh, question was, what is the subject? It is about handling change orders, blue taping, and contracts with uh, contractors. So a question we have um, is, James, do you ever have a contractor bid a job with labor only? Uh, yes, I do sometimes. As long as I have, um, so with our construction budget sheets that we provide, we have the labor and the, uh, the install and labor rates that separated from the, in, uh, the material cost. So yes, some of our guys prefer not to buy all the, the materials, or uh, and actually some of my clients like to buy the materials because they put it on their points and they try to get miles out of it. But as long as that's specified for the labor and it matches up with my budget, I'm okay with doing it that way. Um, I actually, w it's not a bad way to go too because you're also preventing yourself from being taken advantage of because you're not advancing the money for the materials to the contractor. Yeah. You're just paying for them directly. Um, the only thing that I've had issues with on that is sometimes it costs a lot of waste because I'll order things to site and things get missing or they get lost or they're not quite set right. So it's a headache that kind of comes with that. Um, another question that says, uh, just so I'm on the same page, are you writing out the contract to have contractors sign initially, or do you have them agree to the bid and then sign? So I have, what my process is I make my clear scope of work, and then I have them prepare their their uh, estimate, and then then we have them they sign the estimate, my scope of work, and the construction contract, and my construction contract ties all three of those together. 
So um, because they're all tied together, they, it leads to less ambiguity. Do you get a W-2 from gutter guys? Uh, yeah, we use Amigo gutters a lot, um, and they have signed a W-2. Uh, but yes, uh, that the, one of the the question about getting W twos is very good, a good one. You guys make sure you always get your W twos before you pay um, your contractors or subcontractors because what happens is if you can't find them, you know sometimes these guys disappear after you you know you pay them and they finish their job, but you can't get a hold of them. It can kind of make it tough at the end of the year on your taxes. Um, Dale, I use Amigo gutters a lot just because they're big and they're relatively cheap and they can show up pretty quickly. A lot of the smaller guys, they kind of bog down and will lay out my schedule. Um, but one thing about gutters, guys, make sure you get your gutters on quickly, especially right now going into rain season. If you don't get your gutters on, that's going to cause you water issues at your house. And, you know, a lot of times in these basements, even basements that weren't flooded out, once the gutters are off and they start getting wet because they're not being routed away, it's like they start leaking all the time. So, just you know, as we go into this rainy season, really make sure you pay attention to that stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, a good example is the house that uh, Katie did a punch with on. The guy had not put the gutters on for whatever reason, and now it's causing me leaking. Um, so make sure you get all that stuff in. Uh, so, Dale, the... Uh, it is Amigos, A-M-I-G-O-S, Gutters. Um, Nate, we don't post the handouts on our online blog, but I, but I, I will email you the contract forms. And Dale, the, their lead time is about 8 to 10 days right now on Gutters. Any other questions? You guys need referrals for anything? There's a client, so we can definitely refer everybody. Uh, did I get W-2s for my primary residence? Also, yes, I did. Um, and most of the guys that work in my primary residence I've worked with in the past, so I already had W-2s on them. But yes, I, I just like to get information on everybody, just because you never know. Things come up. Uh, weird things happen down the road. Um, I, for example, like the IRS thing where we had to pay the sales tax on those specific contractors. I wish I had a little bit more information to go try to get that money out of them, but they they were gone by then. Um, a question is, I'm working on a project right now that needs a crawl space clean, attic clean out insulation. How do you come up with pricing? So, uh, you know, basically, it, I, I guess my first question is what kind of insulation? If it's blowing insulation, uh, you guys blow in insulation in your attic should not they a lot of guys try to charge you like around two to three grand um for that because they'll do a clean out and it's really not very expensive you know if but most of the times for an attic depending on the square footage what kind of insulation is going in if it's you know something where you have to put rigid in the ceilings then that's going to cost you know quite a bit more that's maybe about three times the cost but roughly about insulation a good rule of thumb is about a dollar a square foot um you know, with the insulation for the blow-in stuff, you guys, if you buy four bags or two bags of insulation, which end up costing you probably 500 bucks at Home Depot, they give you a blow-in machine to rent for free. So if you're really strapped on your budget, I've had handyman guys just go pick up the stuff and, you know, for 20 bucks an hour or 30 bucks an hour, they're blowing in the insulation. It takes them two hours. So it ends up costing me 40 to 60 bucks in labor plus delivery fees. So it's a hundred bucks and then 500 for the insulation. Um, so blow in uh, the cheapest possible insulation. Uh, crawl space, guys, usually if you, I mean, depends on how bad the damage is. If it's a relatively clean one already or just a neglected one, typically your your clean out or your vapor barrier is gonna run you about seven to 700 to 1100 bucks at the most. Um, uh, and then the insulation should be about another thousand bucks underneath there. So typically a full crawl space clean costs me about 1500 to 3000 depending on what's in there. Um, you know, if there's a bunch of rodent activity, that's going to cost more because you got, you know, at that point you want to bring a pest guy out there and pest guys just aren't that cheap. Um, but you know, um, blown in insulation, um, if you're having problems with your, uh, your budget, I just go to Home Depot and rent it. If not, you're probably going to spend about. Yeah, I would say about thousand to two thousand bucks. Um, working on project. Um, 
So what Dale, uh, one of our clients um, said is that she got a W-2 on, um, it, so what uh, she did is she actually uh, had a plumbing job and the plumber said a permit wasn't required. But what she did to protect herself was she documented what he said, she took photos and then had W-2. So yes, she what she's doing is covering her, covering her behind for make sure that there's no things coming at, down the road. And then, yes, you got all the information on them and the work completed. I mean, that's the best you're probably going to do on that. Uh, the uh, next question is, a plumber super expensive? What if you pay a, a good plumber hourly? I will not pay a plumber hourly, general, period, because they charge. Uh, you, I mean, if you call, charge an hourly plumber, they they will, I mean, typically good trades like that are going to charge you 50 to 100 bucks an hour. Um, you know, my rule of thumb for plumbing, if I'm replumbing a whole house, it's three dollars per square foot for all new PEX plumbing in there. And then I pay my plumbers a hundred dollars per fixture if it's a tub, toilet, or uh shower valves, and for simple fixtures like faucets, uh garbage disposals and uh, you know, uh hose bibs, those kind of things, I pay them fifty dollars per unit. And you guys, that's a very good reasonable price. Okay, and this is going to allow you to to keep your budget under control. The other thing about plumbing, uh, which will be expensive for some plumbers, is if you're adding a bathroom in the basement, uh, sometimes, depending if you have a really qualified plumber out there, they don't like doing the demo and the prep work. So you can bring it and they'll charge you a ton to break out the concrete. So you can actually bring in a laborer just to bust out the concrete and it'll probably cut your bid down by a thousand to fifteen hundred bucks if it's a good plumber. Now if it's more of like a middle of the road plumber, which a lot of us use on the on our, our flips, you know, they're usually like one man shop type guys, they will usually bust out the concrete. Um so any more questions about plumbing, insulation, electrical, contracts? Uh, next question was any suggestions on where to get a good contract from Nate? Um, Nate, you're a client of ours, so I will uh, will email you over one. Uh, a question I have uh, is uh, is how are you pricing siding replacement for labor? Um, for that is, let me actually grab my budget sheet. For siding, I factor in $3 per square foot uh, for labor. So if it's, you know, if I, I got a 2,000 square foot house, it's going to cost me about six grand um, to, to reside that whole house. But I kind of have it penciled in for $3 per square foot. Um, depending on which siders I have available to, I have some guys that do it a little bit cheaper. Um, you know, if it's, it, the labor on siding can vary quite a bit. Um, let me point that out. So if you're doing like T111 panels, you should be paying about a dollar square foot because they come in 10 by 10 sheets and the install is very easy compared to other siding. Now, if you're doing regular lap siding, which is about a you know an eight inch lap siding, that should cost you about the three dollars per square foot. Now, if you're doing like a nice craftsman siding, which is going to be a tight one and a half to two inch siding. That's going to cost you more because they actually have installed double the amount of materials because instead of having a six a six inch span, you have a three inch span. So that means they have to nail it twice as much as time. So usually that doesn't cost me twice as much, but it's going to cost me about four dollars to four dollars and fifty cents instead of three. T one okay, Dale asked why would we be using T one eleven? T one eleven. For uh, lower price neighborhood still works as long as it's sealed and prepped correctly they sell it and it, it still works Dale I know people don't like it but sometimes you know we do exactly what the comparables tell us to do so if I got a home that I'm selling in uh, let's say in Kent there's a lot of homes in Kent that have three sides of T111 siding the vertical on there 
and then the front will be lap. I'm going to size my house exactly how all the comparables are sited. So I won't upgrade the siding because a lot of times they're not going to pay me anymore. It's a very good question. Sometimes you just got to use cheaper uh, material and because that's what the comparables tell me to do. Any other questions, guys? <laughs> I will make sure that happens, Dale. That is uh that definitely will happen. Um another question is who is a good contractor to analyze drainage besides a gutter company? I am redoing a home right now and there's a sump pump at the entry for the crawl space that wasn't plumbed into the outside. Let me read that again. I'm redoing a home right now that had a sump pump at the entry of the crawl space that wasn't plumbed to the outside. So where does it pump to is I guess my question. Um, the other thing is uh, call Woo Foundation. They're pretty good at dealing with uh, more drainage design. Or rather, uh, yeah, I wouldn't call a gutter company for drainage. Uh, Woo Foundation is a pretty good company to call. Um, Again, you guys, they start high on their price. You got to negotiate them down. They're just twenty percent high, so just know that and beat them up later. Don't tell them I said that. Um, but uh, Nate, can you tell me where it's plumbed to, or where does the sump pump go to? It should be plumbed. If you have a sump pump, yeah, Woo Construction is it the right uh, person. And if you have a sump pump, it should be tied into your drain line, your sewer line. Oh, uh, okay. So what our client says is it's a jerry rigged right now, so it's a weekend warrior special. It, you guys, weekend warrior fixes are the worst. That will cause more change orders than anything else. Uh, one recommendation I have for people is if you walk into a house and it doesn't quite feel right, but they've done some updating over time, beef up your budget by five percent because chances are what looks a little bit nice is not done correctly. Um, yeah. So uh, what I would do if it was Jerry rigged, I would just get a company out there to look at the whole thing because the sump pump could some pump could not be wired right, couldn't even be set right, it might be in the wrong location. But yeah, I would call Woo Construction out there. Yeah, if what Nate just asked is, uh, it comes out the crawl space door. Yeah, you shouldn't be pumping water right outside your house. That's not that's not a good idea. You want to get it tied into the drain lines. You know what though, Nate? I just had the same exact thing in Tukwila right now. That we just I went I went in the crawl space to do my punch list. I got down there. You guys, this is a good story of why I check people's work. My crawl space guy I've used for years. He's, he's fine. He's a good price. He does a good job. I go in there. It looks good, but they were, we had a little bit of musty smell in the house, and so I went down in the crawl. There was a sump pump down there, which was pumping the wrong way, and um, uh, it was a sump pump. It was pumping the wrong way. But then, what my my I, I was like, why does it smell so musty? It must be coming from the sump pump, which we figured out where it needed to be routed. That wasn't that big of a repair, but actually, we did have to replace that sump pump. But what I did notice as I was researching that is my insul my my insulation guy just put the plastic right over a bunch of like almost garbage. And so, luckily, I went down there because that would have just caused a problem for me on my inspection, and I had to have them come redo it. So even that's a good lesson. Is even if you have the best guy that you've done for years, it will you, you always double check them. All right, guys, we have about five more minutes. Um, so five more minutes of questions. So you got some questions, answer them now. Or not answer them, ask them now. I'll answer them now, hopefully.
Uh, so we have another question um, saying uh, that uh, that their final their contractor wants their final payment, but they can't get their inspections because they're waiting on the inspector schedule. Um, yeah, the, you guys, that can be a little bit of a problem, but what I can tell you is it usually doesn't take longer than 48 hours in any city to get an inspection. Um, there's a couple like Edgewood that might be, you know, maybe three days. But if the guy can't wait for three days, what it says in my contract is I will pay him within 10 days of all completed items. So it gives me a 10 day period. Um, you know, if I'm having a final payment and maybe it's, you know, maybe it's 20 grand to them, I'll cut them like 10 of it and hold 10 back until the permits are signed off on. But always get your permit signed off on before you pay them. I, I, mean, I was just going through something in Edmonds where the guy said it was final. We thought it was final, and then it wasn't. And it's been a total pain in my butt getting it closed out after closing. So the delays and the time and the headache, it's not worth giving the guy the money a little quick. So just make sure you get signed off. Um, and then also you have a copy of all your signed off permits when you're marketing the property, which is always a good thing. Um, one of our clients actually asked about current marketing conditions right now. Uh, yes, I'd more than happy to talk about that. So you guys, what's happening in the market right now is we have we have a little bit of a, a correction um, or you know, some people are calling it a slowdown, which it's not a slowdown because our inventory right now is still half of what a normal inventory climate is. What's going on is we've had a jump in interest rates and then literally from February to June, almost every neighborhood jumped up 10 to 15%. Okay, that is an astronomical jump in this time. So what happens when you have that big of a spike is you get a correction, right? And that's not just real estate, that's any kind of investment. You know, let me look at stocks. Usually when you see like, let's say Tesla shoots way up, then corrects down or same with Facebook or any of the other stocks. It's no different than any other investing. So what happens is, is it peaked up 15%, which we were all happy to be selling our homes during the spring. And then what happens is you get an overcorrection. And now all the homes right now, uh, we've got 15 homes pending in the last two weeks. We've got them all sold for just below spring peak pricing. It, the last peak in spring was kind of the breaking point. Now things are leveling out. So things are getting sold. Um, they don't, and the other thing is guys, most of the homes don't sell unless you underprice a little bit in the first weekend. Buyers have some choices now. They want to take their time. You know, whereas in the spring, there was such little inventory. We we're down to a half month of supply that there wasn't a lot that could be done there. And so buyers were literally just taking any house that they could get. So now, instead of going to just one, which they're hoping they might get and they kind of like, they have time to go look at five houses in the neighborhood. So that's what's really important to make sure that your house is punched out, it looks good, that there's no objections. And you got to wait for your buyer because your house, you know, buyers aren't substituting as much right now. You know, if they want a two-car garage, they're going to get a two-car garage, whereas in the spring, they were hoping they get a one-car garage because there's just no options. So now that they have options, they're waiting for that uh, that perfect house. Um, and you guys, a lot of the, you know what we're kind of advising people to buy right now is more conforming homes in decent neighborhoods, things you know things that didn't affect values as much over the last um, you know 12 months, which you know things that always affect value like busy roads are usually a 10% hit off a of comp. They have not affected us in this last 12 months because of lack of inventory. So things like that are getting their correction. And if you have anything weird, like a busy road or air, uh, you know, a, a bad neighbor or um, lack of parking or no garage or whatever it is in that specific area, those things are gonna, your home will sell for what it's worth, but they're gonna take a little bit more time because you have to find the one specific buyer rather than just having the masses buy your home. So. Uh, things are moving. You just got to price them well. Make sure your house looks good, uh, you know, and make sure you do your scopes of work right, like what I talked about in that Des Moines house. I wanted to do that in a much uh, nicer way and redo the whole project, but by checking my scope of work and my comps, I got in and out of the project. I made a little bit of money, but I'm not sitting on market right now with a really nice house at $4.99 that buyers just won't pay for. So, uh, you know, just be patient. You guys, everybody kind of freaks out because their house doesn't sell in the first weekend, and that's not normal anymore, guys. And honestly, that's never been normal. It's just been normal for us for the last 18 months. But everything's, you know, moving. We're usually getting things pending in about 
25 to 35 days, somewhere in there. Sometimes we're getting them in the first weekend or first two weeks, but be patient. Uh, things are selling. Um, you know, just be realistic and really look at what is for sale in the area. If, you know, you thought your home was going to sell for 700 grand and all of a sudden everything around you is 675, don't price it at 700 unless it's an nicer house. You know, you have to price in today's values. Don't price on what you thought it was worth. Price it on what it will sell for now. That's how all investing works. All right, guys, we're wrapping up with the last couple minutes. Uh, any more last questions? Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, uh, we will have a poll in two weeks on uh, Tuesday, and then uh, you guys, we're going to take a little bit of break for the holidays, and then January 1, we're going to roll out uh, building long-term wealth and how to strategize and build your portfolio. Um, my partner and I have done a lot of 1031 exchange and taking our portfolio from 30 doors to 150 doors over the last three years. So uh, we're kind of talking about how we did that and our strategy and how that worked for us. Um, so we'll be doing another full quote series on building your portfolio, building long-term wealth and cash flow. Um, and then uh, we'll be constantly doing these um, for you guys. So again, tune in in two weeks. We'll have our final wrap up on the, on the 13th, excuse me. Um, and we will, um, and we will be uh, ready for you. So you guys have a good night and uh, thanks for tuning in.